everybody welcome to the blind spot series and this is our i think sixth episode already which is amazing and uh we are talking about the magnificent ambersons which is a iconic film in the history of hollywood uh but i had never seen it and um <laughs> and this year you also had never uh, seen it blind spot never you. seen it so i i love that i love every single month that we keep doing this because <laughs> i'm just amazed with the films that you choose and the ones that you find so this was yeah. one of them that i was like yeah. oh okay <laughs> Well, and I had kind of put off seeing this because I had just heard that it had gotten edited to death. And so I was just like, why would I want to see that? You know, and, and, uh, and now that I seen it, I am like, and it's, it's interesting because I don't think you can feel the cuts that much. You know, it's not like it's like jarring, like what's happening here and what's, you know, like with the, with the justice league. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, it it feels very bland now. There's like nothing right? to it. Like, and I love, um, you know, that they have, like, if you have a good script, then I'll be engaged, you know? Yeah. And like, if they have good character relationships, I'll be engaged. Like one of my favorite, like full on dialogue, heavy film is Grand Hotel. There's like nothing mm. else that happens in that other than like them just having these conversations. But I was so drawn in for like two hours. Yeah. Um, and like that's fine. But if it's dialogue heavy like this one and there's like nothing. Yeah, it, it really doesn't dialogue, until, like, the, uh, until the end when I, I think uh, Fanny's character, Agnes Moorhead, when she really yeah. starts to get to chew the scenery. Yes. I, I think that that's really the only part that starts to get like, yeah. I was yeah. like, thank God you exist. Thank God you're in this movie to kind of yeah. save it for me. <laughs> like, uh-huh. she was fantastic. Like, the best character in yeah. the entire movie. She's great. For sure. I mean, it, it's interesting because I, I'd compare it to something like Meet Me in St. Louis, mm-hmm. I think, uh, as far as, you know, and that was 1944. So that was uh, that was two years later. But that movie, because it's also about a family, it's also about, you know, the uh, the kind of the various drama, uh, yeah. I, this family. Um, but uh, that movie is, has great songs. <laughs> and so <laughs> it, uh, it's, I think it, it has a lot more kind of going for it. Like, I agree. It, it, this is an interesting movie because it's one that, I think actually the whole behind the scenes is just way more interesting than the movie itself. Absolutely. I mean, when you told me the story uh, about what happened to the film, I was just like, well, I want to know more of that. After I watched it, I was like, I I could have sat and watched a documentary about yes. the making of this film instead of me actually watching this film. So yeah. 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 So what happened is, is this a based on a, a novel uh, mm-hmm. I guess a popular novel of the day, and uh, and this is it's by the novel was by Booth Tarkington, a Pulitzer Prize I guess winning novel about the mm-hmm. declining fortunes of a wealthy Midwestern family and the social changes brought by the automobile age, uh, and uh, it was written and directed by Orson Welles. And it must have been painful for him, you know, at the end, how they have those uh, those credits, and for him to say, "This is Orson Welles, I wrote and directed it." It must like, have been no. hard, because <laughs> <laughs> at least the 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 uh, theatrical Justice League, it didn't have that at the end. <laughs> Snyder saying, "Thank God, I would have been like, this is not his. Let's not go there." <laughs> Um, So basically what happened was, is that uh, after Citizen Kane was not as successful as, as we all think, because it's, you know, it's an iconic film that Mm -hmm. uh, he, he did not have carte blanche like he did uh, in previous in that film. And so for this one, he lost control of the editing uh, to RKO and the final version released to audiences differed significantly from his rough cut of the film. More than an hour of footage was cut by the studio which was also shot and substituted for a happier ending. And it says, although Wells' extensive notes for how he wished the film to be have survived, the excise footage was destroyed. And yeah, crazy. 
it is nuts because after watching it, you're like, what what more could they have done with this family in an hour? Like, can you imagine staying there for the extra hour if you didn't enjoy the film? And you're just yeah. like wondering, like, but how long am I going to stay with these characters? You know what I mean? Because even the book, it says that it's like 516 pages. Mm -hmm. But it's like, how can you... I don't know. I'm like, how, like, if people like that stuff, like the historical fiction, like not historical fiction, but like those novels, then I understand. Yeah. But I wouldn't be able to sit there for another hour with this. <laughs> I family. mean, if you, if you want a good example of a movie that is another hour that's a uh, kind of similar, but it has so much more going on, is um, the movie Giant. And this would be in 1956. And Ooh. this is three hours and 20 minutes. It's, it's, really long and <laughs> but yeah. about this family and in the dust bowl and and they're like high high drama um and it's got that movie has james dean and rock hudson elizabeth taylor and and that movie just has so much more sort of interesting characters the setting mm -hmm. is so much more part of what's happening there and it's still too long but I have said for a long time that I think that they should make like an FX miniseries, you know, seven parts of Giant. I feel like it's one of those movies that not that many people really like hold dear or it's not like untouchable, you know? They they could do it. I think yeah. it's just known because of James Dean. Yeah. And like, it's still like, I, I still have it on my watch list. I haven't seen it and I do want to watch it. Yeah. Um, but I know that it's like, it's just, it's James Dean. Like that's yeah. whatever it's known for. So I think remaking it wouldn't be that bad. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I think it would just suit because it's really episodic in feel anyway. It's all mm -hmm. these different things happening to the family and, and the different characters. And it just seems like this would be perfect. Yeah. But I agree. yeah. <laughs> there's a the free idea hollywood take it <laughs> exactly because even this one um the magnificent ambersons in 2002 there was a tv series yeah yeah and I, so, I, that'd be interesting to see but i was surprised how like basically kind of cohesive this really felt considering it, yeah it had like an hour removed like, and a new ending still, filmed exactly and it's like it's still felt like a movie it's not like it's completely butchered and left on yeah. the, like on the cutting room floor um but yeah i just i really do wish that i is just like more engaging with the characters that's my thing it's like i can sit down and watch anything if i actually connect with these characters and i just didn't and i think that's one of the major issues of yeah. this film it has nothing to do um you know with orson wells who's a fantastic director i think that like the technical aspects of the magnificent amberson is really strong like every single tracking shot i was looking at it and i was like oh my god it's so good and then you remember you're like yeah it's orson wells but story-wise it just wasn't there for me are you a fan of rachel's reviews do you look forward to family movie night female film critics panels or the talking disney podcast if so please consider supporting the podcast by becoming a patreon as a patron, you get to access monthly events such as the watch alongs and Q and A's where you get to talk to stars and find out the behind the scenes of the movie making industry. And you can pick what I review for family movie night, or even become a guest on the podcast. Podcasts and YouTube channels are expensive and I really, really could use your help. I would so appreciate it. You also get to be a member of the Facebook group where we talk about all the films that we're seeing and we have so much fun. Go to patreon.com slash hallmarkies and select one of the Rachel's fan tiers. That's patreon.com slash hallmarkies. Yeah, it really, I mean, especially the younger characters, I just didn't really care about at all. That I think yeah. that that uh Agnes Moorhead is Fanny uh, and her sort of drama mm -hmm. with Eugene uh, was more uh, interesting uh, than the uh, the the younger people's drama. I agree with that. And she sure. was and I, great. I think it comes also down to the performances of the like the older couple versus the younger couple. I think that's also a factor here. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay. these particularly the the uh guy who played uh george yeah i think he was weak uh let's see um 
Tim Holt. I thought that yeah. he was pretty flat. I agree. That's why it's, it's like it's, all of his yeah. scenes. I was like, oh. like okay, <laughs> I can't do this. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it, and it, it like it has such an incredible uh, uh, team behind everything. They they had uh, they had Robert Weiss who would go on to direct Sound of Music and West Side Story, doing the editing. They have uh, <laughs> Stanley Cortez, who did The Black Cat and uh, a bunch of other uh, films, doing the cinematography. Uh, you have, obviously, Orson Welles uh, doing every- <laughs> practically everything else. Um, but I guess, I mean, things were so... Bernard Herrmann... Uh, he did this the score but he insisted that his name be removed from the credits because it was so altered that he didn't want to be uh associated with it and he was of course famous for working on a ton of uh alfred hitchcock films with psycho Mm -hmm. the birds vertigo north and northwest that's interesting he's like i'm credited for all of those and then if you butcher this movie i do not want to be credited for this one yeah which is pretty much what he said (laughs) That's wild. <laughs> like, yeah. And uh, and so this film, uh, it's uh, it, so it's written, directed by Orson Welles. It's uh, based on this novel, Boot by Booth Tarkington. And it's the spoiled young heir to the decaying Amberson fortune becomes between his widowed mother and the man she always loved. Uh, and it stars, uh, it stars Joseph Cotton, Tim Holt, and... Uh, Dolores Costello and Baxter Ag- and then Agnes Moorhead and Agnes Moorhead would go on to be famous for uh, she played uh, the uh, aunt Agatha in um, Bewitched. So <laughs> truly a legend or and Dora. Sorry. Her name is Endora, Dora, not Agatha. She played the, she played the aunt, the in Dora on Bewitched. Uh, and uh, so that's wow. what I, I mean, as soon as I saw her, I was like, oh, okay, wow. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, she's really yeah. good. She plays like the sister to this, uh, um, this Isabel, this woman at the beginning of the, the movie. And, mm-hmm. uh, and when there's this drama between uh, Eugene and Isabel, and uh and uh, yeah it gets it gets messy so basically it starts out that isabel rejects eugene and marries this guy wilbur minifer instead and uh then she has the son named george who's a spoiled brat basically yeah yes. and it's it's one of those movies that i think it's it's hard sometimes because they are privileged people but just mm-hmm. everybody is so unlikable, you know, and, and it's hard when you don't have somebody to root for in a story. It is. And then that also comes down to like not connecting to them because if they're so unlike, because sometimes if it's like an unlikable character and they're well-written, you have like some form of connection, like someone can identify with them or what they're doing. Um, but here it's like, I, they're all throwaway characters. Like, I didn't feel like there was any depth to them. Um, they're kind of like two dimensional that I just didn't yeah. want to stick around type of thing, you know? Cause even in giant using our example, like they are kind of all unlikable in that too, but, but there's enough sort of honest moments that you feel and yeah. you don't really feel that here. Uh, until until you have that scene with fanny and the and the the boiler room scene they call it where she flips out over sure. the <laughs> it's not hot it's not cold <laughs> it's so good <laughs> yeah and uh but everybody thinks that they have this ideal life everybody thinks that they are a lot more well off than they are and a mm. lot better than they are and so that isn't i think a theme of the movie it's just sort of like we like the sort of the artifice of wealth and the uh um i don't know just how we like never really know kind of what people are actually going through yeah that is true i Mm -hmm. did get that from here i think that also 
it's very, I want to say, obviously it's outdated, but there are some period pieces that can still resonate with what's happening in the world today somehow, even though mm-hmm. it's like a completely different generation and era. Um, but here it just felt like, whoa, like we really are traveling back there. And like, it just felt, I don't want to say static, but it just felt like kind of lost in that time. Yeah. And I think that was really hard to grasp for me too. And I think a lot of that is because George was just, again, so flat. Like if we had been invested in George as a character, then, then it all kind of would have fallen to place, but, but it's, it's a weak acting performance and it's just a weak character. So basically like he hates Eugene. He thinks that Eugene is, uh, is, a, a social climber is a uh, is just after his mom for you know for the prestige uh not and and but he starts to get interested in lucy eugene's daughter and and again no chemistry nothing like there's just really wasn't much between lucy and and uh and george which yeah yeah i just the thing that I, like, I can't stand about certain movies is like there's not much to even say about it. You know what I mean? After yeah, and you want to talk about it, and it just like it comes again. Like if I, the characters are just so bland that even them having their own discussions, I just didn't. Yeah, I I, I mm-hmm. wish I had like more that I could say that like that I would have you know enjoyed some of it, but. Mm-hmm it's just even the dialogue was just it was weak and like you could tell that they didn't um now they didn't have a grasp of what they were talking about it was just the fact that like it didn't it didn't match it didn't mesh well mm-hmm. um so yeah that- well and so that uh that george is very uh very dismissive of the idea of the cars and that becomes like mm-hmm. a theme within the movie is that you know are you going to embrace change or are you going to kind of like stay in the past and uh he he's very dismissive but uh but it actually eugene ends up kind of making a fortune off of off of cars and automobiles and and uh, so yeah there's this like back and forth between eugene and isabel and George doesn't like the fact that Eugene is dating his mom, but then he's also dating or wants to date Eugene's daughter. Messy. And uh, and Lucy rejects George when he proposes. He says she says that he has no ambition in life other than to be wealthy and to keep things as they are, which is absolutely true. <laughs> I agreed with her. I mean, like. The morals and values are tested here. At that mm-hmm. point, like you have no ambition. It's like I'm just gonna go by my name, right? And, yeah. and a lot of people like they they do do that. They don't want to put effort into actually moving forward and and working. And then obviously that's what yeah. uh, the film is about. So it was interesting to kind of see a different perspective and how their perspectives change based on how you know they approach this like new age to. Yeah. You know, they say that any success in life is, uh, and every overnight sensation is 10 years in the making. And that is really true. Almost anything that you see and you think, oh, wow, they were an overnight success. No, they've been working at it for years and years and years and years. And if they're like a, if they're a true phenom, they probably still have been working on it for years and years and years and years. You got to put the work in. And yeah. like, that's, yeah. Like any success requires a certain degree of luck, but you have to be paying your dues so that you're there when the luck is, when the luck comes. Exactly. Cause it's you all know? timing. It's literally yeah. all timing. It doesn't matter. Like you can like have contacts and like for years and then it just, nothing comes from it. But then this one night, It'll just change mm-hmm. in two seconds, which yeah. is yeah. because you're because you put in the work so that you're there when exactly. that when that connection comes, when that thing happens, when that you know, and uh, and 
it's it's very it's very interesting and george just wants everything to be easy and he blames eugene for turning lucy against him but really like she was pretty independent yeah We'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. It's Harlequin Publishing and bestselling author Rayanne Thane and her new book, 15 Summers Later. 15 summers ago, everything changed. Ava Howe had it all. True love, bestselling memoir, and a life far away from Emerald Creek. But a hidden secret from her past shattered her perfect world. Now she's back home facing the only person who truly understands. Madison Howell has built a life she loves running a no-kill animal shelter and secretly pining for the town veterinarian, Dr. Luke Gentry. But a secret haunts them both. The Howell sisters must confront their past to heal their future. Can they mend the rifts in their lives and find solace together? Experience the power of resilience, family, and love in 15 Summers Later by Ray and Thane. The perfect beach read for anyone needing a story of hope and healing. Now available wherever books are sold or by using the affiliate link below. That's 15 Summers Later by Ran Thane. We know you'll love it. George, like feeling vindictive about the fact that Eugene is dating his mother, Isabel. So he takes his mother to Europe. And she basically gets sick and she dies in Europe. And he won't allow her. He wants, she wants to come back, won't allow her to come back. And uh, yeah, so he is the worst. (laughs) It just, it doesn't make sense. Like, why would you go to those lengths just to keep your mother apart from, like, it just doesn't make any sense. Like, why do you not want that? And yeah, like, why does he care? Like, I mean, I guess because, I mean, because it wouldn't even affect like, he would still be the heir. He would still get, like, I mean, right. so it, it, and, and so Eugene writes Isabel and says, you have to choose between before she dies, you have to choose between me and your son. And so he, she chooses George she chooses her son, but then, <laughs> then she dies. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's interesting. So then like Fanny feels like she needs to then now that Isabel is gone, she needs to like take care of, of Isabel's son. I mean, that makes the most sense Mm -hmm. to do that. Right. Cause she has to be the maternal like figure in his life after he just like screwed everything up for everybody. Yeah. Dr. Amerson, he, he goes crazy. Basically the estate is worthless. Everything's going to pro uh, going bad. Then this Jack, he leaves town to take a job in another city. And uh, then George uh, and it, George is thinking, oh, he's just going to basically mooch off of Fanny uh, and live off of, hi- of her income. Uh, and he's going to become a lawyer. And I did think that was like an interesting scene because he uh, he he finds out that he can't really do that because Fanny has made bad investments. And, uh, and he realizes that he can basically make more money working in this chemical factory than he can as a lawyer. Mm-hmm. And I think there's some truth to that, that, um, that even now, you know, a lot of these jobs that we think of as being kind of like technical or like blue collar the, you know, if you can learn to be like a, a welder, for instance, or something like that, like you can make really good money. Absolutely. Because that's what's in demand right now. Like I feel like everyone is, I think like in, in the last generation, like not my parents' generation, but like my uncle's generation, for example, like in their fifties, forties, fifties right now, they all went to school with the dawn of the computer. So then they kind of launched into tech and then that's what they went to school with. And then a lot of people didn't go to trade school because technology was overpowering everything, even the job market. So then there yeah. you go. Of course, you're going to try to go back to like carpentry and being an electrician because everyone needs people. They need those jobs, you know, like everyone's going to have someone on tap to like call to be, you know, fix a not a light bulb, but like fix any kind of circuit like that. So it's just interesting to see him like his gears turning and like adjust to the times, even though he wasn't, you know, hard hitting into the automobile industry. Mm-hmm. It was just like, he had that in the back of his mind. So he is yeah. thinking he is somewhat ambitious. 
yeah. in that case, right? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because there used to be a time when you could just get a bachelor's degree. It didn't even have to be that was it, like a bachelor of arts. That's all you needed, or a bachelor of science, one or the other. And mm-hmm. and you could get most jobs. And yeah, uh, in, in business now, like I mean like there are tons of people that are have law degrees have M- have MBAs that are working at Target not that there's anything wrong with that but it's just it's not like the guarantee yeah. of like success and people are graduating from these these schools with hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt that they will be yeah. that they cannot get out of even for bankruptcy nothing will get you out of that debt and uh and they're just it's just it's a bad situation it's a very weird cycle to be a part of right now, just to see that like even in school, the professors would tell you that like, of course you're guaranteed a job when you graduate. And then you go into the job market and you're like, what What do you mean we're guaranteed a like, position in our field? Like that didn't make any sense to us after. And then our relationship with, you know, job security is kind of skewed because they lied to us. Yeah. In you know, in school. Yeah, they really so did. It's very I mean, unfortunate. I I I mean, I absolutely felt that going to college, I, I there was never a moment. I mean, I was lucky that I had financial support. Uh, mm-hmm. but there was never a, a sense of from any messaging from anybody that that there you should consider other things besides going to college. Like it was just like you yeah. go to college or you're a loser you know, it was kind of how it was sold for That's us. True. Yeah, it really was. And I, yeah. I just thought that whole scene of him talking to Fanny and saying how I can make more money in this chemical factory than I can being a lawyer was one of the better scenes of the film. I agree. Yeah. Cause that's also like, it's, it's relatable. Yeah. At the same, that's the only time that you kind of understand where he's coming from. Yeah, and he like walks around and he sees all of these factories because he's the one that was so like dismissive of the automobiles and everything. And uh, and uh, the the Amberson Mansion is about to be sold, and uh, it's uh, it's the it's some of the better parts of the movie, I think. Definitely, I completely agree with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and so then we have the, this whole scene where uh, the, 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 the boiler kind of room scene where uh, Fanny is Fanny tells him that, she, that she, I've, I've got $28 and she's got her back against the boiler. It's not hot. It's cold. Uh, it's it's uh, and, and she's just getting increasingly more mania. And mm-hmm. uh, I thought that that was the best acting in the, in the whole thing, in the whole movie. God bless her. Mm-hmm. Truly. <laughs> and Agnes Moore, she said that, uh, he never directed, obviously he all he, about Orson Welles. He says he never directed. Obviously he always directed in some strange oblique way where you thought, well, this isn't right at all. But if you put your career or the role in his hands, he loved to mold you the way he wanted. And it was always much better than you could do yourself. He was the most exciting director that you could possibly imagine. So I, yeah. Yeah. Good for everyone that's worked with him. Because I've heard all good things from like about him mm. compared to other directors. And it says here also, she says that uh, that Moorhead had prepared. Then Wells told her to play like an insane woman. Following that, Wells told her to play it like she abs- she's absolutely inebriated. Then he said to play it with an absolutely va- vacuous mind. Moorhead was thinking to herself, what in the world does he want? She did the scene 11 times, each with a different characterization. For the 12th time, Wells told Moorhead, now play it. After those rehearsals, her playing the scene had a little bit of hysteria. It had a little bit of insanity. It had a little bit of of the little girl. He had mixed it all up in my mind so that the characterization that I played had a little bit of all these. And it was terrible acting where it continued. (laughs) That's so yeah, funny. That's She's like, great. I was bad. What do you mean? And I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm trying but, to like pull I mean, this out of you. 
Well, especially if you think about like how expensive film was then, like now I think we don't really think that much about, about, you know, let's do another scene. Let's do another take. Let's do another take. It's all digital. But for film, you know, back then, like that was a huge effort. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, I think that it says a lot about him and his commitment to getting the exact acting that he wanted from from yeah. a pretty new performer she hadn't done that much up until till till this role yeah well i mean for her for him to like con like pull that out of her like he did his job well yeah because yeah. she did have the best performance out of yeah. like the entire cast so definitely and you got the feeling that there was no way that they were going to cut that part out at least <laughs> No, they're like, this is gold. We have to keep the gold or else like no one's going to come watch this. So yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm being too harsh. on. Also, also, I'm sorry. Okay. He's but, not uh, my cup of tea, but like, it's fine. <laughs> We'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. It's the Hallmarkies Merch Store. Are you looking for that perfect gift for the postable, hardy, or Hallmarkie in your life? What about getting that t-shirt or hoodie that will help you stand out at your next holiday party? Now is the time to check out the Hallmarkies merch store. Full of festive designs by artists like Jessica Miller, Carrie from Hallmark Comics, and more. You can even have more than just shirts, but totes, cell phone cases, notebooks, mugs, and more. And it isn't just Hallmark. We have designs for Anna Green Gables, Man from Snowy River, The Nanny, and more. Every purchase at the merch store goes to help support the podcast and allows us to make the great content you know and love. There are frequent sales, so go to tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies or see the link in the description. That's tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies. Then it, this, it's interesting because this was the reshot ending. So basically George is there, bring uh, in the house, work it's sold. And uh, there's this narrator. It says no one is around to see him receive his comeuppance. And he gets... Uh, injured by this uh, by this car and then lucy and eugene go to see him at the hospital and they they reconcile with him and then eugene tells fanny that isabel's spirit had inspired eugene to bring george under shelter again which uh, and so they're gonna like take care of george so we're all a happy family at the end of this movie <laughs> low-key i wish george would have kind of kicked it with yes. the injury but that's beside the boy because i i literally started laughing when he got injured i was like oh like of all the things <laughs> to get injured by it's an automobile that you've been against since the beginning of this so it was just it was funny yeah yeah so originally the the film was 135 minutes wells felt felt that he needed that it that it needed to be shortened and after she mixed response and uh, then him and Robert Wise removed several minutes from it. They previewed it again, but the audience still didn't like it. And then I know, sad, that must suck. But then, so then why. RKO got their hands on it after they delivered the first cut and uh, they took out. Then RKO went on to delete 40 additional minutes and reshot the ending in late April, early May. And so you got to figure that there probably was, I can't imagine that the, I don't know what's in the novel, but you figure that George must have died in the original. Oh, it makes complete sense if he died in the original. Yeah. This, this, the trajectory, like the way the story was told, it didn't make sense for there to be a happy ending regardless. Mm -hmm. And like, not for any, I, I can't see it like winning awards if it didn't have something grim as its ending. Yeah. You know what I well, mean? it says here actually, so that it says the retakes replaced Wells original ending with a happier one that broke significantly with the film's elegiac tone. The reshot ending is the same as in the novel. So I guess that's, that answers that question. But, uh, but yeah. yeah, I mean, I think some things work in a novel. It might feel sort of poetic, whereas mm. they just feel a little, a little, uh, you, you don't really w want a happy ending for George. No, no, and they I, didn't deserve one at all. Yeah, because he's been so selfish. He's been so, you know, like uh, using his mom, pitting him against Eugene, selfish yeah. to Fanny. 
I uh, didn't really all, all he really cared about was Lucy but since they were both such bland characters we don't really care and so we do want kind of him to have more comeuppance we don't really want Eugene to be like I'm gonna take care of you like no yeah no let him just stay there by himself I'm sorry yeah um, it's it says because Wells had conceded his original contractual right to the final cut, RKO took over the editing, and uh, and says that um, Wells did not approve the cuts, but because he simultaneously working in Brazil on it's all true for RKO, and Nelson Rockefeller had personally asked him to make a film in Latin America as part of the wartime good neighbor policy. His attempts to protect his version ultimately failed. Details of Wells' conflict over the editing are included. And it'd be interesting to watch this. I guess there's a documentary called It's All True. Oh. Uh, yeah, documentary about yeah. it. Of course, I expected that there would be an uproar about a picture which by any ordinary American standards was much darker than anybody was making pictures. Well said, there was just a built in dread of the downbeat movie. And I knew I'd have that to face, but I thought I had a movie so good. I was absolutely certain of its value much more than Kane. It's a tremendous pr- preparation for the boarding house and the terrible walk of George Minifer when he gets his comeuppance. And without that, there wasn't any plot. It's all about some rich people fighting in their house, which is, I think what we're experiencing. I mean, we agree. Yeah. Right. And we do agree. <laughs> Damn. He said, oh, wow. He said that about Citizen Kane. That's a, wow. Okay. <laughs> Much more than All Kane. Right. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> this is his like baby that they butchered. Wow, yeah. That sucks. You're that like, sucks, oh. <laughs> and uh, it said, Wells said he would not have gone to South America without the studio's guarantee that he could finish editing the Magnificent Ambersons there. And they absolutely betrayed me and never gave me a shot at it. You know, all I could do was send wires, but I couldn't walk out on a job which had diplomatic overtones. I was representing America in Brazil. You see, I was a prisoner of the good neighbor policy. That's what made it such a nightmare. I couldn't walk out on Mr. Roosevelt's good neighbor policy with the biggest single thing that they'd done on the cultural level and simply walk away. And I couldn't get my film in my hands. (laughs) So that's just wild. I mean, that's way more interesting than the movie. <laughs> I need a documentary. Like, please, I need to, I need to see it. Especially, yeah. like, honestly, Orson Welles, like, he is a heavy hitter in this industry. Like, yeah. Citizen Kane, like you said, like, it is the... I studied it four times in school. Yeah, The amount oh, yeah. of times that I watched it, I'm just like, I'm tired of it. It's not my favorite, to <laughs> be honest with you. Yeah. Um, it's beautiful. But I, but yeah. It's, yeah. It, it's it's not monumental. My, like, yeah. I get it 100%. And you and I, can we, we can respect, like, what he did with it, but that doesn't mean that we can be in love with the picture, yeah. you know? Agreed. Um. So, yeah. I yeah, just, that's, that's one thing you have to understand, like, it, it, the the... The more of a film fan that you are, the more you realize that you don't have to like all the classics. You can respect them and their importance, but you don't have to like them. Exactly. And I think the more that we do these blind spots, the more I like I feel better about (laughs) not liking certain things. So that makes me really happy. No, it's good for your confidence, I think. You you want uh, to, I mean, I always say like be very suspect of anybody who is uniformly likes everything or is just a uniform contrarian like if they just if if that's their brand don't listen to them like they might be funny but that's about it that you can get from them because it's it's just you want an authentic person and at least i do that's for sure and and i mean this is so interesting too the way that it all got mixed up with politics because he could have he could have left the shooting of this film, but because of this good neighbor policy, because basically what was happening in South America at the time, there, there was a lot of Europeans and Germans in, uh, in South America at this time. And there was a huge worry that those countries were going to be sympathetic to the Nazis. And, and yeah. And so they developed this good neighbor policy and, and that's why I don't know if you've seen or heard of any of those uh, those films in Latin America that Disney made 
uh, the three caballeros and, yes. uh, yeah. And what those were is those were good. These are part of this good neighbor policy and they were huge hits at, at the time. And they did so much to, uh, I mean, you watch them now and you're just like, these are really boring. Like what's going on. But, uh, it's especially through caballeros. It's, uh, it's I love that like, one. it's like Donald chasing skirt for like 30 minutes. <laughs> You know what? As a kid, I'm like, this is it. This is yeah. the stuff that I want to see. I, I love it. I have it on VHS. But it was like, incredibly effective propaganda. Absolutely effective yeah. propaganda. And Wild. and it, uh, I mean, because if those countries had turned to the Nazis, mm-hmm. that would have been hugely Im- impactful on the war. If, if we'd had, if we had had countries on our so close to us that mm. were that were uh uh in the axis powers that would have been that would have completely changed everything and uh so yeah. that i mean i can completely understand why he is so conflicted and doesn't want to leave because you're talking 1942 i mean that's key time yeah, it's That's, in the middle of everything. Yeah, no messing around in 1942. And no. and so, yeah, I mean, what he really did was sacrifice his art for for his country. Mm-hmm. You he know? did. He really did. And uh, yeah. I, you know, I find that fascinating. I find that really interesting. And it's certainly more interesting than anything in this movie. <laughs> We're sorry, but this is how we feel. Okay. That's how we feel. Yeah, they're pretty much the only thing that stood up stood out to me this movie, aside from some of the technicals, like you mentioned. The the there's some great shots. The um the cinematographer, uh Stanley Cortez is his name. There's some really good work there. But um, yeah. but it was pretty much that boiler scene with uh Fanny and the scene uh where he uh where George is wandering around the city and uh, seeing all the factories and the, you know, all of that. So uh, it's, it's just seemed pretty forgettable to me. It just wasn't that good. I agree with you. I'm sorry guys. But it'd be very interesting to see, to, I mean, of course you'd be interested to see the full cut and yeah, yeah, but um, I don't think it would change your opinion. I'm going to be yeah. honest with you. Um, I mean, it, it it might a little bit with a different ending, a little yeah, bit maybe. That's fair, but, maybe yeah. Mm, but yeah, Not, this yeah. is just it's just one of those films. So, uh, and and there are a lot of films that kind of the backstory around it is kind of more interesting than the actual film itself. Uh, something like Waterworld, you know, it's like it's really pretty boring, but like. The, the <laughs> everything that went into it and the making of it and all that stuff is kind of interesting. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I didn't think it I'm happens, bringing up Water it? World. <laughs> you did. It's okay. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> but uh, so next month, it's very exciting for Blind Spot. We are going to be talking about Deadpool. And you might be saying, well, what? You've never seen Deadpool? And you have seen it, Manda. I have never oh, seen it. Oh, so. he's my boy. I'm so <laughs> excited for you to like be welcomed into the Wade Wilson <laughs> fan club. I'm so stoked for that. Yeah, one. I'm nervous about it because part of the reason why I haven't watched it is because I don't think it's my jam. But uh, we'll see. I certainly will keep an open mind. I i i watched the i, I watched the Once Upon a Deadpool. Because I figured that, and this was Deadpool 2, edited, mm-hmm. whatever. And I figured, like, okay, I better see it because I'm, like, the target audience in a way. You know, like, mm-hmm. I, uh, I, it was, is this PG-13 version of Deadpool 2, but I'd never seen Deadpool. So, anyway, I go to see it, and I hated it. I thought he oh. was, I thought it was so <laughs> So, I'm nervous about. I'm nervous. <laughs> But I know that that's not like the real Deadpool 2. It's, you know, this edited yeah. down version of it. Watered down, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, you know, I need to see both of the real ones uh, before seeing Deadpool and Wolverine. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, 
I just don't know if that brand of sass is my is 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 my brand of sass, but we'll see. <laughs> Fingers show. crossed. Fingers crossed. I'm hoping because that would just be like the best turn of events possible. Now you were gonna find a superhero movie you hadn't seen that yes. to watch uh, for this month because we I made all these decisions before we'd agreed to do this. That's why there's some. Uh, yeah. um, uh, and I think had you said Blade that you were gonna do? I said or? Blade. Blade. Yeah, okay. I was gonna. Yeah, I've never seen it. Uh, I know. I never like, have too. So maybe I'll watch it as well, so we can talk about. Yay! Blade. Sounds good to me. Yeah. We can do a double whammy. Of, well, Blade right now, there's like so much talk about the new I one know. with Mahershala Ali. So I think that's really good that we can kind it's of tap into that like, too. How can it's it possibly good. be that hard? It's not. You it's have just, a two-time no, Oscar winner. He's won two Oscars. I, I, I want hard. to call Mahershala Ali myself and apologize on their behalf for like fumbling this so badly. Like, sir, I'm sorry that you're going <laughs> yeah. through this. Like, you don't deserve it at all. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, I will <laughs> have my full written write-up on the Magnus Ambersons uh, that I'll put a link to. I haven't written it yet, but... Uh, when this pub by the time this publishes i will so you have that to read and uh <laughs> that should be fun to write and uh yeah we'll look forward to next month uh for deadpool it'll Ooh. be fun <laughs> yeah and uh <laughs> and this is always a lot of fun where can people find you your channel everything yeah, you guys can always follow me over at AMX NDA Reviews on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. You can check out my website, candidxcinema.com, and my YouTube, Candid Cinema. Great. And you can find me at Rachel's Reviews all over social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. So check that out. Also, make sure that you're following the podcast on, and also make sure you're following the podcast on iTunes. And if you listen on there, please leave your ratings and reviews. Really appreciate that. And if you are watching YouTube, please give the the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel we appreciate that so much we also have our patron group which is the best way you can support me and you can uh we're going to be starting a whole new classic films series that i'm going to be doing every week just finished the afi passion series uh nice. so you get weekly exclusive reviews and you get our watch alongs which are so fun we just did with uh w stewart for well suited for christmas which Monday is the best movie it's seriously so good. It really? I love it so much. Aww. Yeah. So it was so fun to watch it with her. Uh, it's one of the best uh, Christmas movies of recent memory. Really good. Oh my God, uh, love yeah. That. And, uh, and next month, I'm so excited. We are going to have Catherine Davis is actress, Catherine Davis for, and we're going to watch her movie. Santa's got style, which is a delight and hilarious. And so <laughs> if I love you want that. to find out the behind the scenes uh, of your favorite holiday movies, well, most of our holiday movies, because that's where I know people, uh, then you should check out the Patreon. It's really fun. And the merch store. So check that out. And uh, thanks so much, everybody. We'll talk to you later. Bye.